just uh, heard an uh, excellent uh, colloquium by uh, Eliza Templon, uh, who we remember as uh, Eliza miller Richard. She used to be a student uh, at the astronomy department. Uh, currently, she's an assistant professor at Greenland College and will be moving to Maryland. And uh, as it turns out, the Greenland College, the liberal arts uh, college in Iowa, who is well known for rigorous uh, academic studies and for the tradition of social responsibility. Uh, and two of them, of their uh, uh, alums, are uh, one is Thomas Czech, that uh, used to be uh, uh, the president of Howard Hughes. Uh, he is a Nobel laureate in chemistry, quite distinguished. And also Gary Cooper is an alum. <laughs> so that's a very uh, interesting uh, college. Uh, we also heard a, a, a number of lectures by Vin Bishop, and she will also give the CFA colloquium today, and we'll also speak uh, at this lunch. And so we'll start with uh, Dan Dorazio, our own uh, postdoc, uh, that will tell us about tidal disruptions and the stellar mass function. And then we'll hear from Evin, um, that is visiting us uh, for the week from Leiden, uh, and we are. Uh, <coughs> Very much looking forward to her CFA colloquium. One can always learn important insights uh, from her talk. And she will talk here at lunch about the uh, protoplanetary disk structures, uh, gas versus dust. Uh, and then we'll hear from uh, Eliza, and she will talk about an observational diagnostic for distinguishing between clouds and haze in hot exoplanet atmospheres. And finally, we'll hear from our own uh, graduate student, the uh, Lehman Garrison, student of Daniel Eisenstein, and he will talk about n body cosmology and abacus. Dan. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so I'll start by saying this is the first time I'll ever give a talk on tidal disruptions and the stellar mass function, for that matter. But I have been to quite a few talks on tidal disruptions, and one thing I've learned from them is that a good tidal disruption talk shows a picture like this. <laughs> which I think is a simulation by James. Is that right, James? So yeah, this is a simulation of a star being disrupted by a black hole denoted here by that purple dot. Uh, as for the stellar mass function, I've been to far fewer talks on that topic, but the idea of the work I want to describe to you now is how we can use the population of tidal disruption events to learn something about the stellar mass function, uh, specifically the stellar mass function of nuclear star clusters where the population of these disrupted stars comes from. So to start, here are the players in the game of tidal disruption, a star and a black hole, a star with a mass m star and a mass to radius relationship. The black hole has an, a mass as well. Uh, and I think another thing I've learned from tidal disruption talks is that uh, you're supposed to say that when a star wanders too close to a black hole, it'll be ripped apart, and that ripping apart will uh, be the tidal disruption event that you observe. However, to quantify that a little more, too close, uh, what does too close mean? Too close can be given by this tidal radius here, r sub t, which I've drawn in an orange dotted line around the black hole. And this tidal radius is the radius at which the tidal forces from the black hole will rip apart the star. And it, of course, depends on the mass of the black hole, the mass of the star, and the radius of the star. Uh, so I think the best way to think about this is with an example. If we have a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole, and we have stars that have some type of main sequence mass radius relationship, then for stars with a mass greater than the mass of the sun, this tidal disruption radius is kind of like the example I drew here. It, it, it resides outside of the horizon of the black hole, and that star will disrupt outside of the black hole, and possibly we'll see it as a tidal disruption event. If, though, the uh, mass of the star is less than a solar mass in this example, the tidal disruption radius lies within the horizon of the black hole, and the star will eventually be disrupted, but not in a way that we'll see. It'll plunge uh, darkly into the black hole. So I guess you could say when a star wanders too close to a black hole, it'll be disrupted and we'll see it. If it wanders too close, it'll be disrupted and we won't see it, depending on the mass of the star, of course, and that's the point. So to quantify that even further, as I said, we have these two types of tidal disruption events. The ones that I see, I'm just going to call tidal disruption flares for now. Sorry for the confusion. But uh, we have these two types of events. And to distinguish between, between the two, we want to compare these two different radii. One is the one I just introduced, the tidal radius. The other is uh, at what point 
a kind of a point of no return for the star, which is a kind of a proxy for the event horizon. And this is called the innermost bound circular orbit of the black hole. It depends on the black hole mass and spin, and it's essentially the radius from the black hole where the star will plunge before being able to, to give off any light that we'd see in a disruption. So then, right, the idea is that if you have a mass radius relation for your stars, and you know the black, black hole mass and spin, uh, you can equate these two radii and derive a critical stellar mass, above which you'll see the disruption, below which you will not see the disruption. And so the interesting thing that I want to think about here is that if we can measure a rate of tidal disruptions as a function of black hole mass, disregarding the spin for a moment, uh, then you should be able to learn something about the makeup of the stars that are being disrupted because of, of this relation, this critical mass. So here, another example to, to express, elaborate on that point. If we have some measurement of this rate of tidal disruptions, and we can measure the black hole mass that is disrupting the, the star, so we have this rate per black hole mass, then for small mass black holes, you would expect the tidal disruption rate to be proportional just to how many black holes there are, which is given by the black hole mass function. But then as you approach this, um, so yes, for this example, let's just say we only have uh, solar mass stars with solar radii. Then as we saw, 10 to the 8 solar mass black holes are kind of the limit of what will disrupt these. And so in this example where you just have a monochromatic, monochromatic distribution of stars, you'll have this kind of shape where you just cut drastically in the tidal disruption rate at a, a given black hole mass. So if you can measure something like this, uh, then you can learn something about the, the stellar distribution. And so before I tell you, before we go beyond the case of just a solar-like star uh, being disrupted, I'll say that this kind of information, a black hole mass-dependent tidal disruption rate, is something that is being estimated now. So just this year, Schuert van Veltzen published a paper where he looked at the vol volumetric rate of tidal disruptions as a function of the black hole mass and found something similar to what I was just describing, a rate that follows the black hole mass function, and then at large black hole masses drops drastically. So in this paper, uh, Van Veltsen used this idea to, 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 or this plot essentially, to show that some evidence for there being a black hole horizon because of this plummet in rate. However, if you assume that horizons exist and that these are tidal disruption events for real, um, then you can, as I've been saying, learn something about the stellar mass function from modeling this kind of rate as a function of mass. So the way that we do that is, I'll show you in the next slide, how we compute a probability that if you see some tidal disruption, you'll measure a given black hole mass, which will just give us this kind of, this kind of relation here. So the way we, we do this, calculate this type of probability, is through Bayes' theorem, essentially where we have a black hole mass function, how many black holes there are to give a mass, and we multiply it by the probability that a star thrown at the black hole will be disrupted in a way that we'll see, given that we know the black hole mass. And from that, we need the stellar mass function. So here is the number of stars as a function, per mass as a function of their mass, and I've just plotted kind of something proportional to a standard Krupa mass function here, where we have, for low mass stars, these shallower slopes, and for high mass stars, we have a, a steeper slope, which we allow to vary and call C. And we also have a limit on the minimum and maximum mass in our distribution of stars. And to compute this, all we need to do is compute what this critical mass for disruption was that I was talking about in the first couple of slides. So given the black hole mass, we just compute what is this critical mass above which we'll see the disruption, and then this probability of seeing disruption is just the ratio of the number of stars that can be disrupted to the total number of stars. And so this then depends on these parameters, the maximum, minimum mass, and the slope of your mass function. Okay, so I'm going to show you some examples of what this looks like. So here, and, and how this depends on the different parameters in the model. So here's the black hole mass again, here's the rate, here's these data points I had before just to guide your eye from the Van Veltsen paper. And the first parameter I'm going to look at is spin. And so, this might look surprising, but there's, this plot is showing that there's very, very little dependence on spin. This is, uh, this is because what we're looking at is an average of many disruptions for a black hole mass, and that innermost bound circular orbit that I mentioned is different for prograde and retrograde orbits. So if a star comes this way, 
it's a different radius than the star comes in this way. And we average ov over all of these, and in the end, the black hole spin isn't actually very important for this, which is one thing that allows us to learn about the mass function rather than the black hole spin. The next parameter is the minimum stellar mass in your distribution. And so here I've plotted from very small, uh, like 10 times Jupiter mass up to a solar mass. And you see what this affects is the steepness of this knee, this cutoff, and specifically here in this uh, region right before the cutoff. So you can understand this uh, behavior in that for a fixed maximum mass, if you increase the minimum mass, you have a narrower range of masses. So you're approaching this kind of monochromatic stellar mass uh, case again where you just drop off uh, steeply. So the minimum mass affects this knee. And then there are two different parameters I've plotted here, so don't get overwhelmed. But in black is the maximum mass. And what this does is give you more big fluffy stars that can be disrupted by the same mass black hole. So if you increase the maximum mass from one solar mass to 100 solar masses, you just increase the probability of seeing disruptions at higher mass black holes. And the purple is the metal metallicity of your stars. And this effectively changes the mass radius relation. For higher metallicity, which is the dotted line here, you have puffier stars. So they both do the same thing. The mass metallicity affects uh, stars above a solar mass, though. And then finally, we have the slope, the high mass slope of the IMF, which just changes the abundance of uh, small to high mass stars and also changes this kind of knee shape here. So with the time I have left, I want to show you what we've done now to try and use the existing data and then some mock future data to see if we can constrain anything about the mass function so far. So everyone loves the corner plot, I'm sure. Uh, so what we've done here, the orange plots are the data from Stuart Van Velten's paper. And we've essentially tried to recover best fit parameters of our model by sampling uh, or fitting, essentially, our model to this data. And so this is preliminary. I'm not going to go too much into what constraints we have, except to say that it's interesting so far we find evidence for if we have the slope of the IMF here um, and the metallicity. The 2D posterior here um, ha has some evidence that it wants to have a top-heavy uh, slope as well as high metallicity, which is kind of interesting because this is uh, there's evidence for this type of high metallicity, top-heavy slope in the galactic center. So there'll be more on this when we publish the paper. And then finally, I just want to say in the future, LSST is expected to find 4,000, or at least the rate is 4,000 tidal disruption events per year, which seems like an astounding number. Um, and what's, what's interesting, though, is that we can get black hole mass measurements for them from the light curve itself, from a paper that James uh, was on Mockler 2018. So presumably, if we can identify TDEs, we'll have their black hole mass measurement, and we can start to fill out this, uh, to constrain this tidal disruption per black hole mass rate. And we've just done some work to show that you can recover some of these parameters, specifically the slope of the IMF uh, well. And so t stay tuned for some more concrete results about, about what we constrain about the stellar mass function. So that's it for now. So this is, yeah, so this, I would say, is uniquely targets the stellar mass function in these nuclear star clusters, which may be different so than the local IMF or the local mass function. And so the black hole mass function is also something we can start to constrain from this as well, if you want to go that way, because the, the, this part, as I said, is almost all the black hole mass function, except for maybe some... Uh, if there are preferences for tidal disruptions as a function of mass, that might change. But for now, we've just chosen the best estimates of the black hole, local black hole mass function. Yeah, I, I guess I'm confused because what about giants? You know, yeah, especially so, for these nuclear um, mm -hmm. clusters, they tend, that it, locally at least, to have fairly high mass stars, which become giants. You know, you, we have a continuous evolution of these stars on the giant branch. And so 
Mm -hmm. If a significant fraction of the disruptions are of giants, wouldn't you be learning something in addition to this? Yes, so the red giants so far we've <coughs> assumed are a small fraction of all these stars and also tidal disruptions of giants as far as I understand are supposed to be lower luminosity events. I believe Morgan, is Morgan here? Yeah. Has a paper on spoon feeding giants, something about how a disruption of gi giants works in a different way that perhaps you could distinguish them. So there might be contamination in this from giants and uh, maybe Morgan and I could talk more about what that would look like, yeah, so but it's a good point. Those percentages, you know, on the order of a few percent of these events, uh, as they happen, will be generated by giant stars. But as we observe them, you might be able to distinguish based on the time scales. <coughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting, though, because they, you know, you get disruptions further out, right? So sure. yeah. the percentage could, in fact, be larger. And then they, they also read remnants that uh, you could detect because they could be soft x ray sources. So maybe when you have 4,000 events, you can have two of these plots, one for giants <laughs> and one for main sequence stars. Well, and, exactly. Yeah. I think it's another mm -hmm. avenue through which we can learn, and it's yeah. probably something that, that we can discuss. Yeah. Any other time for one more question? So the sort of stellar dynamical properties of that cluster affect the peri-center distributions of stars that are the right. result. <coughs> Right. So you're saying if there's a preference for certain types of stars to be thrown in on centrifugal orbits, will they be disrupted? Well, yeah. So I didn't mention that, but there is a term that, uh, for now, our fitting depends on the shape, and there's a term that we're kind of. Uh, th this doesn't. This if this analysis doesn't depend on the the details of the stellar dynamics which brings stars in, unless there's a preference for only certain types of stars to be thrown in towards the black hole. In that case, then you then you're really just probing the mass function of stars that will be preferentially thrown on centrophilic orbits. But I think we're running out of time, so I can, yeah. <laughs>
actually this as the explanation for the difference between the images that we're seeing. But there was another effect pointed out already by André Tré and uh, Stéphane Guillotot, namely that simply the lines are optically thick and the dust is optically thin, and therefore you see the, dust, the gas much more extended than the dust. Uh, so now that we're getting not just a few images of disks, but we are getting actually lots of images of disks with Alma at very high signal to noise, we thought we should readdress this, this issue now in a self-consistent manner of both the gas and the dust. Uh, so since this is an ITC luncheon, I should show at least a little bit a, a flow diagram of the modeling structure that has been done. Uh, we start basically with a disk uh, a gas structure that can be simply parameterized, can also take it from a hydro simulations. You saw for the grain size distribution, the vertical settling, also the radial drift. Uh, and then you go into your calculations of the dust temperature, the gas temperature, your chemistry, your thermal balance of the gas, grain size dependence of that, and then you go finally to your observables. So all of that is now in a very nice package that is called uh, DALI, dust and lines, <laughs> basically, all systematically together. Okay, so what do we get? So here is one of these uh, a disk that is very big in the, in the gas and is, is tiny basically in the dust. This is one of these huge disks. And here it's clear that if we start to model this, then here in both the dust and also in the lines, then the, the bulk of the effect is actually due to this optical depth effect. It's not due to the radial drift. Uh, that is also an effect, but it's mostly in the sharpness here of this, uh, of this drop. But the bulk of the difference is actually due to the optical depth uh, effects. Um, so again, this is just one disk, and we wanted to really go from just this, you know, studying a few disks that may not at all be uh, typical of the bulk of the disk sample to a much larger sample. So together with Jonathan Williams and especially his graduate student Megan Anstel, uh, we did actually a survey of all the disks in lupus. So here is the lupus molecular cloud. And Spitzer and Holschall have found one, more than 100 sort of class two sources, uh, Titori stars with disks. These are mostly K and M type uh, stars. And so we used ALMA to just point at them for one minute each. Um, that gives you plenty of signal to noise on the continuum. It's a little bit marginal for the lines, but it was the best that we could do with this sort of the typical amount of time that uh, a time allocation uh, committee is, 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 is able to give you here. So here you see all the continuum images. You see some of these large disks again, even in the continuum. A lot of very small disks here, uh, um, uh, shown here below, that are actually unresolved at this resolution, so down to 20 astronomical units in, in terms of radius. Now, how about the gas? Um, there's lots to tell about the survey. I could give a whole colloquium of an hour on this, but I will just focus here on one of the very recent results that we did, is namely look at the gas radii compared with the dust radii. And so now we have 12 CO actually, only for a handful of sources, unfortunately, uh, that we have really good detections, uh, about 20 or 30 of them out of the, the 100. Uh, but you see already, here is the, the gas to dust is equal, and here is one and a half and three times the dust radius. And you see that generally they form full, the data points fall in this range of one and a half to three times the dust radius. So again, using our modeling techniques, we can now show that actually in these cases, both processes play a role. The optical depth effect is still a large uh, part of it, but we also have evidence that, that grain growth must be invoked in order to explain this difference. And in fact, again, with our models, we can sort of show then that eventually uh, this may also help to constrain the viscous evolution uh, parameter, the alpha parameter, because with time the dust must spread, the gas disk must spread, and so eventually these gas radii also provide a uh, measure of this uh, uh, viscous evolution parameter alpha. Good, so that was the first uh, sort of lesson. The second lesson is on the transitional disks. So these are disks that have inner cavities in their dust. And they have always been claimed to be sort of the best examples of where you can look for, say, planet formation in, uh, in action. The idea is that there would already be a giant planet embedded in this disk that would create a pressure bump, and that is really where the dust will be trapped, and that is generating sort of this uh, dust image with a large hole in it. But now how about the gas? Well, this model also predicts that the gas hole should be smaller than the dust hole, and that the difference between the size of the gas and the dust hole should actually be a measure of the mass of the embedded uh, planet. 
So here are some of the uh, data that we obtained. This is already quite old data by now from cycle one, um, but still not superseded by, <laughs> by anything else. Um, so here is basically the size of the, uh, the dust disk. Oops. Uh, and here you see the gas disk, and you see, clearly see the gas sitting actually inside the dust hole. So it's presently in there, and it's, uh, it shows a gas cavity that is smaller than the dust cavity. So lesson one is gas and millimeter dust really do not follow each other, and that the gas cavity is really smaller than the dust cavity. We don't see that just in this source, but we see it also in a, in a sort of by now uh, close to a dozen uh, of other sources where we have seen the transitional disk where we've seen the similar effect. The second point that we actually then want to do is quantify this dust and gas drop because the amount, the depth basically of that uh, gas uh, drop is also again a measure of any potential planets that could be there. And we have done that again with the DALI models, and the drops actually uh, the drops are at least of a factor of 100. So that combination of a gas disk that is smaller than a dust disk and a deep gas drop actually points uh, very much to uh, sort of a planet as the explanation of this uh, uh, phenomenon, rather than alternative explanations like photo evaporation <coughs> or dead zones or, or anything else. Good, so then of course you want to go one step further um, and you say, well, can we then constrain the planet mass if we can uh, see this? And here are again some examples of hydro simulations and it's clear that this is uh, for one Jupiter mass planet, this for nine Jupiter mass planet, this is for different values of the viscosities and you see that the depth and the width of the gas gap actually depends on the mass of the embedded planet. <clears throat> so in principle we have a di diagnostic there, but it's not easy to to sort of disentangle sort of planet mass and viscosity. Those two come in uh, very strongly, which is one of the reasons that we are trying to sort of constrain <laughs> viscosity uh, in some other way, like uh, from the dust sizes. But in any case, if you ever want to spatially resolve these gaps, you need a, a high angular resolution on the gas that we have not yet quite been able to obtain. Um, but in principle, you have a very nice diagnostic here because this is basically for a nine Jupiter mass planet. If you take these hydro simulations, what the images look like. Um, so here you see the, the millimeter dust in a nice ring. Uh, and here you see the gas. Again, the gas ring is smaller than the dust uh, ring. Uh, but you can now measure actually your CO ring in any of the transitions of CO that you want. And you can also measure the radius of the, the gap that you have here. And then you can show basically a relation between these two observables that you get directly from your same ELMA image. You don't need even a scattered light image to, to, to complement it uh, in order to say something <clears throat> in comparison of this, uh, of this relation. Um, so here is basically what we find from a set of uh, hydro simulations, uh, sort of a relation between these two quantities and uh, the mass of the embedded planet. Again, lots of caveats in what you assume about the uh, hydro simulations, but at least it gives sort of a first handle of what you can expect. Now the observations are sort of all in, in this regime that we have so far. Um, so they actually point to quite massive planets that were causing these, these rather big cavities that we're seeing to date, uh, certainly of the order of at least five to maybe 10 Jupiter mass planets. And the problem is they have generally not yet been seen in these. People have looked for them and quite hard even, but they have not yet uh, been seen. And so in the final slide that I wanted to do is go to uh, one source there actually an embedded planet had been claimed. This is HD 169142. Uh, again, beautiful. Actually, it has a cavity and a gap actually in this particular case. And the protoplanet that was seen in scattered light was actually located over here. And so we thought, well, this is a perfect example then to test sort of these models. But as this work was actually in progress, a new uh, scattered light image came from the, the VLT sphere, which is a wonderful instrument, much higher uh, angular resolution and sensitivity. And you see here again, this same structure with an inner ring, a cavity, and uh, a second ring, uh, but no hint of a planet anymore. So the planet seems to have disappeared. Nevertheless, <laughs> if we do, again, the, the exercise of the gas, then we do see, here is uh, where the, the second dust ring is, 
we do again see a gas cavity, and we see again that uh, we can see some gas sitting in there, but, but not too much. We can again quantify this, and we find a factor of 220 drop, uh, both in the gap and in the cavity. So, what does this tell us? I mean, this is sort of where the theorists now have to come in. <laughs> because the gas data still point to, to something opening up a cavity also in the gas. Yet, it, the planet is not recovered, actually, in the, uh, in the scattered light data. So either, you know, rather than one massive planet, there are multiple low-mass planets, or we have to go to completely different scenarios that people have not yet thought about for making that do. So here I want to end and basically say that uh, I think it's really the combination of the, the gas and the dust that is needed to constrain the various models. And what we're lacking at the moment is really deep gas and high angular resolution uh, gas data to go along with these uh, wonderful dust images. Thank you very much. Oh, you mean radio velocity studies of the star, uh, or, uh, or well, yeah, yeah uh, well, interesting. Yeah, we, we haven't. We, I don't think we have the uh, spatial resolution yet to do that. We're still looking on 20 AU scales. So, yeah, the yeah, at the time dependence, but these are of course still at large distances. So, you have to. Look at many, many years, but but yeah, over a ten-year period, uh, that would twenty-year uh, period, you, you may start to, <laughs> to get some differences. Yeah, yeah, good point. Questions for you? Your gas uh, pictures were brightest in the center. Uh, that's, did, does the gas actually must disappear right around the star? Right. So well, yeah, so there are two effects here. Uh, so, uh, of course, UV radiation is strongest closest to the star, so that starts to uh, dissociate uh, carbon monoxide, but it can actually self-shield, so that protects it also. And we've shown that you can actually uh, get down to Earth masses of gas before you lose the carbon monoxide. The second thing is that the UV radiation heats the gas, so it actually becomes higher temperatures, so any optically thick line will actually become brighter very close to the star. So this is why you need to do this detailed modeling of the, both the gas temperature and the, the abundance of CO in order to infer the underlying gas structure because, because both of these effects come in. But definitely temperature comes in very strongly for the, uh, for the optically thick lines. <laughs> Right, so that basically goes back to the, the hydro simulations that, uh, uh, that basically uh, uh, carve out basically a gap in the, <laughs> uh, the uh, sort sort of at the position of the planet, uh, which is here in this particular model at uh, 20 astronomical units. Uh, it causes a very deep drop, basically, in the gas. There are other scenarios that have been invoked to explain sort of a... Uh, a dust trap here at this uh, this pressure bump um, that uh, could involve, for example, dead zones uh, at the edge of, oh, sorry, small pressure bumps at the edge of dead zones, but those wouldn't have such deep uh, uh, drops that you have here in the density. It is basically the, uh, the, the, the young planet that is in here that is attracting the gas and uh, clearing out uh, sort of a cavity in the, in the, in the gas disk. So the width of the gap also depends on the, the pressure, and the width in the gap in the gas depends on the gas pressure. Is it something you can measure from the gas temperature? <laughs> I wish we could. Yeah. Uh, so, but there are large gradients in temperatures and density, so it's not a a, a simple that. Uh, yes, and then there is the question: What are you know other possible contributions to the pressure than only thermal pressure? Yeah. <laughs>
Well, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so um, actually I'm taking over uh, at uh, the General Assembly in uh, two thousand. what is in August this year in Vienna. And 2019 promises to be a very exciting year because it's actually 100 years IAU. So uh, we are going to do that through a series of celebrations across the world. We're celebrating not just the IAU, but basically 100 years of astronomical discoveries. It's also 100 years of the, uh, the Eddington expedition uh, that, uh, <laughs> of course, proved uh, Einstein theory. Um, so we're, it's 50 years moon landing, so there's a lots of reasons to celebrate astronomy in 2019. And so we're coordinating that now through a, a whole series of flagship events across the world. So I very much hope that you all also all participate in that. Um, great. So this morning I talked about small planets, super Earths. Uh, I decided to talk to you guys at lunch today about a different type of planet, hot, very highly irradiated giant planets. Uh, the topic relates to distinguishing between clouds and haze. Um, the, I, I should mention this is, a, this is published in AppJ Letters last year, so you can read more about it there. Um, the first question that I always get when I present something like this is, what do these different terms mean, cloud and haze? And there's a, a problem, actually, in the, if you look at the exoplanet literature, there's different groups using these terms in very different ways. So let's first have a little vocabulary lesson. Um, and this is actually thanks to Sarah Hurst at Johns Hopkins, who wrote a very nice uh, blog post for the Planetary Science, uh, for the Planetary Society about this uh, and, and the usage of these terms in the planetary science community. So in this talk, and, and the, the terms that I'd like to try to reinforce, is that uh, aerosol is the blanket term for particles suspended in a gas, solid and liquid particles suspended in a gas. Um, a cloud is something that is formed via condensation, uh, equilibrium condensation processes. So you have some species you exceed <coughs> Its, uh, its partial pressure exceeds its saturation vapor pressure, and it condenses into a solid or liquid. And this is a reversible process. So if the temperature pressure conditions change and you go back below the saturation vapor pressure, then that species will evaporate um, uh, and go back into the gas phase. A haze is something that is formed through chemical processes, uh, typically photochemistry, uh, which results in the formation of involatile Solid. So think here about um, about Venus's sulfuric acid haze, about uh, hazes in Titan that are formed photochemically and and, uh, and forming robust particles. All right. So that's the context. And and then uh, in terms of exoplanet observations, we now know that aerosols uh, appear to be ubiquitous in exoplanet spectra. We see evidence, strong evidence for aerosols uh, from giant planets down to smaller planets. Um, and the way, that this, the way that this tends to reveal itself is through muted spectral features in transmission spectra. So basically there's some particle layer uh, higher up in the atmosphere that is uh, scattering and absorbing light before you get down to, uh, to being optically thin in the layers where the molecular absorption would otherwise occur. Uh, so they just tend to flatten out transmission spectra. Um, the problem is we can identify that the aerosols are there, but we, uh, we don't have a good way to make, uh, to make strong headway on constraining the key chemical and physical properties and processes associated with these aerosols from there. The, uh, the spectral features or the spectral signature of aerosols tends to be uh, flat, kind of uh, weakly wavelength varying 
uh, opacity sources, things like Rayleigh scattering, where you have a, a slope or some knee scattering, something sloped or flat across a broad wavelength range. And so it's hard to get really unique constraints on what the chemical composition uh, of the aerosol is and what the physical process is that is forming those aerosols. Uh, so we need another path forward. And this is going to be a problem even in the era of Jada Lucy. Better data do doesn't really help uh, us answer these questions, these, these fundamental questions about aerosols. Um, so we need a different path forward. And, um, and the idea that we came up with was to look at the most highly irradiated uh, giant planets, or the most highly irradiated exoplanets in general. And here I'm talking about planets that have equilibrium temperatures in excess of 2,000 Kelvin. And the advantage here, and, and, and I'm also talking here, of, of course, about very close-in planets, so they're going to be tidally locked. They have a permanent day side and night side. Um, and the advantage here is that you cannot form a cloud on the day side of one of these planets because it is too hot for anything to condense. Um, so you can only form a cloud, a condensation cloud, on the night side of such an object or on the cooler morning side terminator of that planet. Um, on the flip side, hazes can, because they're formed by photochemistry and they require direct irradiation, can only form on the day side of such an object. Uh, the hazes can form on the day side, and then atmospheric dynamics could carry that haze around to the evening terminator as well. So you expect the different types of aerosols to be present in physically different portions of the planetary atmosphere. Uh, so while we can't get unique spectral signatures of the different types of aerosols, what we can try to do is constrain the location of the aerosols. Uh, okay, this, this idea is borne out in more complex um, models of thermal structures of highly irradiated planet atmospheres. This is for the example of a planet WASP-121b. It's a fairly well-studied, highly irradiated hot Jupiter. Um, and stick. Stick. <laughs> right in here. Let's use the stick. Um, uh, in 3D models, this is borne out that, uh, that we expect, uh, these are temperature pressure profiles at different, uh, different longitudes. On the night side and on the morning side limb, um, the temperature dips down past the condensation curves for the high temperature condensate. So we expect things like metals and rocks to be forming into clouds. Um, but on the day side and the evening limb, you would not, uh, it, the flip on it remains too hot. So you would not get any of these condensation clouds. Okay, and then, and then how do we probe different parts of a planet, given that we don't tend to spatially resolve an exoplanet. Uh, so the trick here is to do transmission spectroscopy. And if we think about the transmission geometry, the planet is, when the planet is transiting, the night side is facing you. Um, and so the leading limb uh, on the transit uh, corresponds to the morning terminator of the planet. And on the trailing side of the transit, the egress, uh, you will be primarily seeing the evening terminator of the planet in front of the star. So you're absorbing through primarily through different portions of the planet on ingress versus egress. Um, and then we expect the clouds to be present on, um, on the morning limb and the hazes. If there are hazes present instead, those would be on the evening limb. Okay, so if we do in, if we do ingress egress spectroscopy and difference the ingress spectrum and the egress spectrum, that's going to tell us which side uh, of the planet primarily has the aerosols. All right, so some more detailed modeling. Um, this is now looking again at the same planet, WASP 121. B, um, its transmission spectrum, so we have data for its full transmission spectrum when the planet is fully in front of the host star. It's consistent with a partially uh, cloudy or partially hazy interpretation. So down here, these are the existing data, and the blue and the green lines are what we've, we've taken two 1D models and we've mixed them 50-50. We've weighted them half-half. Uh, one of the models is a cloud-free atmosphere model, and the other model is either um, a model where we've added in just a gray cloud or a Rayleigh scattering cl cloud or aerosol. Uh, and in both cases, we can fit the existing data very, very nicely by this, this idea that the planet has one hemisphere with aerosols and one hemisphere that's clear. Okay, so if we did the ingress-egress spectroscopy, this is, now, uh, this is now a model of what the transmission spectrum would look for an integrated ingress versus an integrated egress where we have only placed the aerosol on one hemisphere of the planet, one side of the planet, either on the, the leading limb or 
the trailing limb. And you get exactly what I, uh, what I just said, which is that you get the more muted spectral features on the red line uh, for the side of the planet that has the aerosols present. And then we would want to difference these two spectra uh, to look for the signature of where the aerosols actually are. So this is the different spectrum down below. And I should say we've just uh, we've, we've, we've done these two end member uh, scenarios where either the cloud is just fully gray across all wavelengths or, uh, or is just uh, fully Rayleigh scattering. Uh, so then you see that lambda to the minus 4 come in over here. Um, so for the case of this particular planet, using models that match the full transit transmission spectrum, um, we predict that the signature, the, the ingress-egress difference signature, should, uh, should be on the order of 100 parts per million. Uh, this is a challenging but not impossible measurement to make with HST. We did the calculation, and it would require, for this planet, it would require something like five individual ingresses and five individual egresses to be observed and binned together. With JWST, you could do this in, uh, in, in probably a single go. One transit. Um, we've also, so those were those are just 1D models that we've used. We've also done the same or looked at the same effect with a full self-consistent 3D uh, atmospheric circulation model, where uh, we've placed clouds. We've allowed the clouds to just exist on one uh, on one side of the planet, on the eastern hemisphere or on the western hemisphere. Um, and modeled the radiative transfer to generate the transmission spectrum through that 3D atmosphere. This is work done with a, a current undergraduate, Victoria Di Tommaso, although I heard that you guys just admitted her into your PhD program, so she could be here next year. Um, she's really fantastic. Um, so these are the results of, um, of calculating the transmission spectra through, uh, through her 3D models, and you get the, you get the same result. Um, in that the, uh, the cloudy side produces a very flat uh, in either ingress or egress spectrum. And then, and then when, you, uh, when you look at the, um, the clear side, you get strong spectral features. And that, that differencing signature is about the same magnitude that we, uh, that we had already predicted. So consistency between 3D and 1D models. And I will just wrap up right there. So we have, uh, just to summarize, uh, ingress aerosols imply a condensation cloud for, for a highly irradiated planet. Ingress aerosols imply a condensation cloud. Egress aerosols imply a photochemical haze. Uh, what if you see aerosols equivalently on both sides of the planet? That's a little bit harder to interpret. But um, in that case, my money would be on haze, because the haze particles um, can persist for longer time scales. You could imagine that a haze could, through atmospheric dynamics, could be circulated fully around the planet that would require that the haze particles uh, can persist for, for day to several day long time scales without settling out or being destroyed. Um, and uh, from an observational standpoint, J JWST will have the sensitivity to measure these ingress-egress differences uh, at the level of precision required to determine whether we are indeed seeing clouds or hazes or, uh, or what for these very highly irradiated planets. Um, so in terms of clouds, because these planets are very, very hot, the types of things that would condense are not, are not species that we find as clouds in the solar system. You could find things like iron clouds or silicate clouds or, um, yeah, magnesium sulfide clouds, hot, yeah, rock, rocks and, and metals condensing. For hazes, um, the, so the, one, one interesting thing is that uh, nobody actually has... Um, None of, the, none of the theoretical models at this point uh, predict that hazes should form readily for such highly irradiated objects. But that is very informed by solar system studies and our understanding of, of photochemistry and reaction rates kind of within our comfort zone. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if you still can form photochemical hazes even in hotter atmospheres. And we just haven't, we haven't gotten all the way there with our, with our theory yet. Oh, so morning, I'm saying, 
What am I saying? <laughs> um, here's the night side facing you, um, and the so in in the direction in the direction of the planet's rotation, it's the side that's that's between night the night side and the day side. Um, it's it, it's in the it's in the frame of reference of the planet, but it's it's defined due to the direction of rotation of the planet. Yeah. No, that has not been quantified. I think that I think that's important to look at, uh, especially you know, could could you have ion photochemistry on the night side, which would which would convolute this kind of interpretation? I think that's an important effect to look at, and I don't think anyone's really looking at it beyond recognizing that that that, that is a potential problem out there. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Lehman Garrison. I'm a grad student working here with Daniel Eisenstein, uh, and I'll be telling you about our work on an, um, a new uh, cosmological embody code called Abacus, and this is work done in collaboration with um, scientists here and at the University of Arizona. So first, a little motivation why we want to do cosmo cosmological embody simulations. Uh, so we have a theory of large-scale structure formation, lambda CDM, and one way to think of embodied simulations is as a forward modeling tool for this theory. Uh, galaxy surveys observe galaxy clustering, and then we want to work backwards from that clustering to cosmological parameters, or even to test the underlying theory itself. There's a lot of complications in uh, large scale structure formation, though. Uh, galaxies form in very uh, nonlinear um, sites, like halos, where you get very complicated patterns of dark matter clustering. There are also redshift space distortions in which the peculiar, the observed position of galaxy um, is displaced by the velocity along the line of sight to the observer. There's also um, higher order correlations that you would like to be able to quantify to reduce your error bars, like the two-point function and the three-point function. Uh, and these aren't always well captured by analytic techniques or approximate, other approximate modeling techniques. Um, and so you'd like to also be able to measure the covariance of all of these observables in order to actually put error bars on your, your measurements of the parameters, and this drives you to very large cosmological volumes. But you also want very high resolution, mass resolution, so you can figure out where the galaxies are actually forming. So this makes it a, a difficult computational problem, and our attempt at solving this problem is called Abacus. Uh, so it's a new embody code that we've been writing for a little while now um, for very fast, large cosmological simulations based on an exact split of the near field and far field force. And I'll explain what that means in the next few slides. Uh, but the result is that we don't actually need to hold all the simulation particles in memory at once. We can load them off of disks on demand. And that means you don't have to use a supercomputer to do these simulations. The uh, the force calculations are GPU accelerated, uh, and the way we split the force also gives us very high force accuracy at a modest computational cost. Um, so I mentioned the near field, far field split. So let me explain what that means. Uh, so we're going to take all of the, the particles in our simulation and decompose in our domain into a cubic grid of cells. Uh, then we're going to ask 
what is the force on a particle in one cell? And of course, you, what you really want is the force on each particle from all other particles. But if you do that the brute force way, then that's an n squared computation where n is the number of, of particles. And this is the classic um, computational difficulty of the n body problem. So we want to avoid doing that and only do the n squared part for particles that are nearby each other. This lets you resolve orbits well, but then you can treat distant particles as being a collection of multipoles because you don't really need to know the details of exactly where they are. Um, so in this cartoon here, the near field is in white here, so we would uh, calculate the interaction between these two particles with direct summation, and then these two particles would interact uh, via the far field force. So this idea of splitting the near field and far field is not new. You might be familiar with um, ideas like P cubed M, which is particle, particle, particle mesh codes. Um, however, uh, so the way those work is you take all the particles and you assign their mass to a grid and then you solve the Poisson equation on the grid to get the force. So the grid tells you the force from all particles. But then if you want to integrate small orbits of, of nearby particles with direct summation, uh, you can't do that exactly because the mass of those particles has already been assigned to the mesh. So if you're also getting a force from uh, direct summation, then you're double counting mass. So an another way to state that is that the far field force leaks into the, the near field. So what you're going for is this one on R squared uh, total force. Um, and so the far field force leaks into the near field. So you have to compute some compensated kernel, which is this dashed line here, instead of the one on uh, R squared line here. Um, so when we say that abacus has an exact split of the near field far field force, we're saying that we don't have this leakage. And instead, when we're computing um, pairwise summations, we're actually doing the one on R squared problem. And same in the far field. And once you're actually doing one on R squared in the near field, this is when modern computing hardware just takes off. It's a really simple computation, especially for GPUs. OK, so let me, let me unpack this uh, far field computation a little more. I mentioned multipoles. Um, that's, that's where we get the force from. So here's our domain decomposition again. So in every cell, we're going to compute the multipoles of the particle distribution at every time step. Uh, to some relatively high order, like order eight. Then we're going to combine this with a pre-computed derivatives tensor, which is going to give you the force due to the multiples here at some, um, some distant cell, a number of cells away. Now note that in this white region is the, the near field, and we've carved this out of the derivatives. So the multiples are never exerting a force on their, their neighbor cells. They're only giving the, the far field force far away. Uh, so this gives you what we call the Taylors, which is a Taylor series expansion of the uh, gravitational potential given number of cells away. And you don't want to do this just for, um, just for one cell. You want to do it uh, for the multiples in every cell. So this becomes a convolution of a derivatives tensor on this, this lattice, this domain decomposition, over the multiples, which gives you a set of Taylors. So how do we put all this together into a, um, into a code? So let's go back to our domain decomposition. Now we're going to uh, call each of these planes of cells a slab. These are actually 2D planes of cells filled with particles. And initially, they're going to be sitting on, on disks, on hard drives. So the first thing you have to do is um, read a slab into memory. Then we're going to read the next one. And while we're reading this, we can be computing the far field force from the Taylors that we got from the convolution. Uh, we're going to read another slab and another one. And now we're ready to do the near field force, which we compute on GPUs. So why do we have to wait this long? So we want to compute the near field force uh, on this slab. But there could be particles in slabs 3 or 1 that are right on the boundary with slab 2. And so if you're trying to integrate orbits correctly, you need to make sure you get the guys that are all close together. Um, so now we've gotten the near and far field force on slab 2, so we can combine them get an acceleration, which, um, and then we apply the kick, which is a velocity update, and a drift, which is a, which is a position update. Now we're ready to compute the multipoles on these updated particle positions and write, the, uh, and write everything out to disk. And that's the whole pipeline to update particle positions. So now we're ready to slide this pipeline down by one slab and repeat. 
So the takeaway, really, is that only a fraction, only a small fraction of the simulation volume needs to be in memory at once, which means you don't need to use the supercomputer. We flow through the simulation volume uh, in this, this pipeline scheme. Uh, we, we get to overlap the, the CPU, GPU, and uh, disk computations. So uh, that gives us a lot of efficiency. And because we're doing one on R squared in the near field on the GPUs instead of some compensated kernel, um, we get excellent speed and accuracy. So as a proof of concept, a couple months ago, we ran a, a really large simulation, a, a what's traditionally considered a supercomputer-sized simulation of 70 billion particles in a 4 gigaparsec box on a, a single computer. So, so uh, we have a computer lab here down by the loading dock, and this is a, a half rack. It's about like chest high. And so we, we, we build our own computers to do these, these computations just with, with parts that you can buy on Amazon, though. Um, and so we, we just use this one computer. We're, we're not using this whole cluster of computers, just this one guy here, Franklin. Um, <laughs> took, it took about two months to run this simulation. So a supercomputer would do this problem in a couple of days. But Franklin also only costs $10,000 instead of supercomputer cost. Uh, we do have aspirations to, to speed up Abacus, though. Um, we, it's, a, uh, it's still a relatively immature code, I think, that doesn't have a lot of features that uh, more sophisticated codes have, but we, um, so, so we have aspirations to, to reduce this time to completion from two months down to something like a month. Um, or better, who knows. Um, so lastly, I do want to advertise that uh, we've just finished running a, a whole suite of simulations. Um, we're calling the, the Abacus Cosmos Suite. It's 125 simulations, uh, which we've produced Halo catalogs from. Uh, and all of these are publicly available now. And we put out a, a paper and also a website to help you use these simulations. So if you have need for a large-scale structured data set, you can uh, check out the website listed on the screen. Or come talk to me. I'm, I'm happy to help anybody get started using these simulations. So in summary, Abacus is our code that we're writing to do massive <coughs> cosmological m-body simulations on just a single node. And we get to do that because of the exact near-field, far-field split of the gravitational force. We're hoping for a public release later this year. Um, but in the meantime, if you need to use large-scale large -scale structured data sets, then uh, just Google Abacus Cosmos. Thanks. It's actually not because you need a lot of um, storage per node. So, so Franklin has um, many terabytes of, of hard drives per node in RAID, and no cloud cluster is going to have hard drives in RAID on every node. Yeah, that's a really great um, idea. Um, to do it this way, I just wanted to um, ask you, how do you get a handle on the uncertainties? In the um, so in the the force the force accuracy you mean? Yes. yes. So we, we uh, tested in a number of ways. You can put a, a random particle distribution in the box and then brute for get the answer via brute force and then ask what abacus gives. Um, and we we have excellent accuracy that way. Our, our median fractional error is about ten to the minus five, whereas um, on the force where typical values are more like ten to the minus three or ten to the minus four. Um, and and def definitely at, at these speeds. I think no other code can produce this accuracy. Um, you can also do homogeneous lattices where all the, the forces should be held to uh, zero on every particle. And we find that Abacus basically does that.
50 years to make the own work proper for that. Thank you all for coming. Oh yeah, just come talk to me if you have questions. I, I remember when you were doing yeah. the course and you were talking about you spending all your time debugging. Oh yeah. So this was it then. Oh, this, this is it, yeah. I could have spent another hour talking about all the debugging. But. Thanks, thank you. It's fun to finally talk about it. Yeah, right. Well, you've made a big investment, but now you have a big payoff. Yeah, I, I hope so. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, uh, I think that's probably one of the best attended fourth talks of a long time. I know, I don't know. A long time. time. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. Yes. Thank you. So the question is, is, is this done minus five accuracy enough, or does it?